Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today I'm very happy to welcome to this radio program writer, activist, intellectual, and historian Robin D.G. Kelly to talk about his book Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. It was first published in 2002. It's now being republished 20 years later. Robin D.G. Kelly is Distinguished Professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. He's the author of a number of other books as well, including Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original, and Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class. Robin D.G. Kelly, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thanks so much, Mitch. I'm a, a fan of your show, I have to say. I hardly ever miss it. Oh, no. You, as, as you know, some days are, are better than others, but I think this will be a very good day, <laughs> and I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. Yes, um, your book, again, Freedom Dreams, published in 2002, being republished now in, in 2022 with a, with a, with a new foreword and, and some additional uh, writings in it. Can you compare and contrast the environment in which the book first came out in 2002 and, and today? Right. So um, to think about that moment, it's very precise. This is the end of the Clinton years in the beginning of the Bush years. And as we know, in hindsight, the differences weren't that stark. You know, one of the, the huge differences, you know, of course, was that as I was, as I um, envisioned the book, it was right in the middle of a mass organizing around the murder of Amadou Diallo, which some of your listeners may know was um, an immigrant from Guinea who was killed by the police in New York City. And a lot of the protests that erupted in New York, in fact, around the country, but especially New York, looked like a kind of miniature version of the George Floyd protest. You know, that is to say, people came out struggling, not just against police violence, but other kinds of questions of what causes uh, premature death for Black people. So, you know, that was a huge thing. And it was also a great deal of optimism because those protests were multiracial. They weren't just all Black. And this is a time when New York City was a place to go. If you're a young Black person, you might die because the police were just killing people left and right. Uh, and this is the time of Giuliani. All, exactly, time of Giuliani, and this was um, the, also on the national level. This was this transition where you have, you know, George Bush is elected. As I'm writing the book, and then as I'm still writing the book, you have the um, 9/11 attacks and the war in Afghanistan. That was the context. That was the context in which I finished the book. And this was also a moment politically where a lot of young people were kind of torn. I mean, you had people who felt, look, you know, there's nothing, there's no future. Capitalism is just what it is, so I'm going to get paid. And then others, like, this, I can't see a future. Capitalism is terrible, so we have to end it. <laughs> How do we do that? And so I'm dealing with these students and dealing with activists and organizers, many of and, and introducing them to a lot of the movements that emerged in the late 80s and 90s that in fact were arrayed against Clinton neoliberalism, that were you know, in fact fighting some of the same fights that we are fighting today, anti-immigrant racism, you know, reparations, you know, neoliberalism, police violence, you know, a reproductive justice, that was an issue. So fast forward, you know, you, you go from this moment of, of possibility, the backlash, the war on terror, and then after the book comes out, you know, the struggles around the war in Iraq and all that, to 2020, spring 2020, when um, I'd been thinking about putting out a, a, a new edition of Freedom Dreams for a while, but spring 2020 was really the catalyst for uh, thinking about the ways in which those same struggles continued how much there was a kind of um on one hand a kind of deja vu looking at like, like an ups like a scaling up of the Amdu Diallo moment in the streets around the country and around the world against state violence which again is the opening for other kinds of struggles and then the backlash that comes after that um and so I think there is 
you know, there's some differences, definitely, in terms of not just scale, but also in terms of the way that these struggles or visions of freedom um, have really expanded, uh, have, you know, in which you have queer leadership and feminist leadership of these organizations that were, were once considered to be like the core of, of, of these social movements, disability justice, um, you know, emerging as really, really important central uh, uh, struggles for a socialist future, right? You know, um, so it's not just about inclusivity. What you see is a broader, uh, more radical vision of what's possible in a moment when it looks like fascism, as we've known it, um, is more imminent than ever, at least the last 70, 80 years, you know. So there's this interesting moment in dynamic that we're in right now. And I'm not saying that the book is necessarily like the answer. Or the, in fact, I, I go against that argument. But to suggest that, you know, we're in this critical moment where politically those radical movements that erupted in, in spring 2020 are being told, you know what, you got to be pragmatic. Stop talking about defunding the police. We've got to get Biden election, elected. Uh, we, <laughs> we've got to stop Trump. So therefore, tamp down that talk, tamp down those freedom dreams. And I think this is one of the, the huge, I wouldn't to call it a mistake because not everyone abided by that, but it was, you know, it, it was telling for why we actually need to remind ourselves why we join these movements in the first place, why they erupt, you know, what they're struggling for, you know, what kind of new world are we trying to create? Or are we trying to simply put band-aids on the liberal world that has given us uh, so much pain and anguish? I mean, it seems in a way that that is what has happened. I mean, you know, you had Amazon uh, suddenly putting out Black Lives Matter. You'd watch a baseball game on the pitcher's mound in the back would say BLM hashtag. And, right. and, and you saw corporate America sort of talking um, this talk uh, in the aftermath of spring 2020. That's absolutely right. And it's so and this is also another important lesson in how quickly uh, what could be uh, understood or produced as a kind of radical vision could be appropriated. You know, and again, we see we saw this in 2020. Uh, we saw it in uh, the, at the end of the 90s. You know, where um, I kind of deal with this, but it's not really a central theme. Where liberal multiculturalism, you know, which initially wasn't so liberal, it was actually trying to re write the narrative of the United States and the world uh, and also trying to fight to dismantle the structures of sexism, patriarchy, and racism. And this becomes instead um, a kind of new realignment. That is politically, how do you get people who are brown, black, you know, female, queer, into spaces of power to do the bidding of capital, to do the bidding of militarism, to do the bidding of the what becomes a climate catastrophe. And we see we see this, you know, um, we're seeing this right now. And what's interesting is, despite the fact that liberal multiculturalism itself is not really a threat to power, as we speak, and as you know this because you've talked about this, the whole argument against so-called critical race theory. I say so-called because it's what they're fighting is not critical race theory, but liberal multiculturalism. But the whole argument about wokeness is really stand, pressing down on a liberal idea that is inclusion without changing the status quo. So now the, the right is like, we don't even want inclusion. We don't, we don't even want you to change the narrative a little bit because that is considered dangerous. Why? It's not because the people who advocate for these uh, uh, new laws and 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 um, uh, and who are trying to set, shut down sort of liberal multicultural education. Not that they even believe this. They are building a base around fascism, around a racist fascism, 
uh, you know, which is convincing a lot of white people, not all of them, thank goodness, but convincing a lot of white people, especially white working people, that, you know, your uh, misery is tied to su the success of these people of color and of women and of trans people. It's tied to their rights. And the more rights they get, the less you get. And, and, they're, and what they're doing is they're taking over the country. We need to take it back. You know, of course, they never had it. <laughs> the white working class has never had this country. <laughs> that's, that's a tragedy. They think they did. They've been extracted from and exploited the same, you know, to, to the same degree, essentially. But that doesn't really matter. What matters is that they're even pushing back against liberalism to, to support a kind of fascist turn uh, to crush, you know, through incorporation, crush white working people. And so when we talk about freedom dreams and the point of the book, one of the things I don't deal with, but I think it's worth thinking about, is, well, I said, that's not true. I, I deal with it a little bit. That is, that many of the freedom dreams that emerge out of Black liberation movements from the left, surrealism, Black feminism, have always been expansive enough to open the doors for freedom for all. That was the whole point of freedom dreams. The whole point was that whether it's a struggle for reparations, a struggle for communism, a struggle for, you know, um, the end patriarchy, racist patriarchy. Every single one of them envisioned a world in which the oppressions of all people would be eliminated, you know, and that's a tragedy. So you have, so imagine you, you're pitting uh, so-called anti-wokeness fascism against freedom dreams, against liberatory dreams that have that say the state should be something that could solve people's problems, that medical care should not be something you pay for, that no one should go hungry, that everyone should have some place to live, that we can find new ways to be together as a community, right? And, and that's, that's the freedom dream, uh, freedom dreams multiple, uh, plural, that, that actually drive uh, this book and the possibility of something different. You very much piqued my interest when you said that they are not fighting against critical race theory, but liberal multiculturalism. Can can you distinguish between those two for me? Sure. Yeah, no, critical race theory actually um, is a uh, legal, uh, I don't call it a doctrine, but a, a, a mode of, of analysis that comes out of law that basically asks the fundamental question, that is, how is it we can get all this legislation passed that uh, is supposed to um, protect people from racism? Like, you know, from the 14th Amendment to the Civil uh, Rights Act to the voting rights. How can we have these things and racism still persists? You know, and so the argument is that as, as lawyers, as legal scholars, we can't always look at legislation uh, and, and policy as the explanation or even the form of power that could solve the problem. You have to look elsewhere. So critical race theory says, look, you need to look at other structures of power, including ideological uh, structures. That is the way that people think, what's the common sense. And that's it. It's, it's, it's not something that ne that's necessarily taught in elementary school, <laughs> you know, um, but maybe it should be. I don't know. Uh, now, liberal multiculturalism basically says America is fundamentally a good place. We have a constitutional republic. That constitution was designed to make sure that in the long run, we'd have fairness, some level of, I wouldn't call it equity, but certainly uh, equal opportunity, that, that the negative... Uh, uh, we'd have sort of negative liberties. That is to say, uh, freedoms not to have things suppressed, like the right to free speech, um, the right to privacy, you know, this sort of thing. So that, that America is fundamentally good, but it has practiced these exclusionary, uh, 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 you know, actions, right, over the years. And in excluding we've missed out the great diversity of America. So what liberal multiculturalism does is that, look, we're just going to add some more stories to the American story. 
And we're going to show, A, how those other people who have been excluded actually benefit from the American story, you know, and how they've shaped the American story. So there's certain stories that will never be in a liberal multicultural story. You know, I, I've never seen um, liberal multiculturalism tell the story of the Communist Party, for example. <laughs> it's just they're not there. But you can certainly have um, even someone as radical as Frederick Douglass, you know, becomes incorporated in because he would be presented as someone who upholds the American dream of freedom and liberty, right? Um, so in a sense, liberal multiculturalism does not change the status quo. It is simply diversity practice. Diversity practice is the same as a corporate practice. Um, we, we like our boardrooms. We just need to integrate them. We like, we like the state. We just need to get a black president, you know, that what they don't want is the dismantling of these structures. And that's what liberal multiculturalism protects us, protects against. Right. right. That's, and those are fundamentally the differences between the two. I mean, the irony is that critical race theory is more dangerous, is more radical. Um, it's not to say that it doesn't have its elements of liberalism, but it does suggest that we can't go forward without a, um, fundamental transformation of society. I mean, that is the difference. Liberal multiculturalism is not asking for that. They're asking for diversity. Anti-woke racism, another term you, you mentioned earlier, is interesting. And, and I do think of Tucker Carlson and, and his show, and oftentimes they do sort of put together the anti-woke sentiment and anger at corporate America today right. that is right. you know, promoting multicultural liberalism or liberal multiculturalism um but it's just not on the right you find that as well i, I think there mm -hmm. is elements within the left that mm -hmm. say concentration of quote-unquote woke culture means that we are ignoring more class right. based kind of struggles and what's really important you hit the problem on the head as as always um you're absolutely right. And in fact, this, this, uh, this contest between what's called class reductionism and race reductionism, which I think is a false contest altogether, but this idea uh, coming from the left, and I've actually written about this in, in my book, Your Mama's Dysfunctional, back in the 90s. So it's not even a new phenomenon. But this notion coming from a particular sort of segment of the Marxist uh, left says, the more we talk about race, the less we talk about class. Race gets in the way. Um, and, and, you know, all these movements for, uh, that are based on what, what's considered to be identity politics undermine class solidarity. And so what we need to do is talk about what makes us alike, what makes us similar. Don't spend so much talking about, you know, queer liberation, um, black liberation. That stuff is wrong. Um, and so in many ways, back in the 90s, and we can see it reflected today, there was a, a, a movement afoot to bring back the Enlightenment. And by Enlightenment, there was some confusion about which Enlightenment. <laughs> there's always confusion. But the idea was that there's, there's certain things that are universal and things that are particular. So we need to bring back and emphasize the universal. Uh, and that the universal are things like, you know, um, the way that capitalism oppresses everybody uh, by stripping huge swaths of, of communities from access to means of production and leaving them with nothing but the but um, the ability to, to sell their 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 bod their their wages, sell their labor for wages, uh, and that's really the fundamental question. Um, and of course, there's pushback to that, you know, which is to say, there's a history even among the left, even in, within revolutionary situations in which, you know, racism, sexism, patriarchy continue to exist within those organizations, within those movements, um, let alone within the vision or the manifestos of those movements that are trying to build a new world. And part of, and this gets down to the core issue, the core debate is whether or not, this is an old debate, whether or not the socialist utopia would automatically lead 
to racism, sexism, patriarchy, you know, um, transphobia, uh, uh, all that would just sort of disappear because the material basis for those kinds of oppressions would disappear. That's one, that's, that's a kind of, a particular kind of narrow Marxist argument. The other is that it's not going to disappear. One, because it preceded capitalism, you know, and two, because even we could see within social societies when they try to build new forms of equality and equity, that racism and sexism are deeply ingrained. It's not just ingrained in the mind. It's not about changing minds. It's also structural. In fact, it's primarily structural. And that is the issue. So this brings us to, I was just having this debate recently about um, what does it mean to build a class movement in a world in which racism, sexism continue to persist? Like, how do you do that? And one of the arguments I was trying to, to make was that, you know, because, well, let me back up. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, folks who, who believe that if you say words like white supremacy, if you bring up structural racism, that it's gonna alienate white people, so don't bring it up. You know, that, that the movement is too important. You don't wanna split people. But my argument is that if white people could understand how they're oppressed by patriarchy and racism, the ways in which they function to make life more miserable for them, then they're going to understand that fighting white supremacy is not only in their interest, but it's a matter of survival. You cannot fight capitalism without fighting the colonial basis for capitalism. You can't fight capitalism without fighting white supremacy. You can't fight capitalism without fighting sexism and patriarchy. You can't fight capitalism without fighting homophobia, transphobia, and all that. In fact, you can't fight capitalism without fighting nationalism, you know? Because this, these are these are the pillars upon which capitalism emerged. So this is it's it's to me it's not even a a debate. It's a false debate because we're not. No one has time to reduce anything to class or race. We have to understand the whole the whole structure of capitalism as a civilization. You know, as something much greater than the means of production and surplus value. You know. It's much bigger than that. And we have to fight a much bigger fight. And again, we come back to freedom themes. The dream of liberation in all levels and all aspects of life for all peoples, which is the dream of the Kombahi River Collective emerged in, in the Boston area with Barbara Smith and every, um, that, that dream based on their vision of identity politics, that is to say that everyone has an identity in relationship to structures of power. That is the dream that could possibly liberate the whole. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Robin D.G. Kelly, who's a distinguished professor, and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at University of California, Los Angeles. We are in conversation about his book, which has been republished from 2002, now out, called, now out again, called Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. I think this is an interesting segue then into something I was hoping to talk about specifically about your book, a chapter I very much enjoyed spending time with, and that was chapter number two, which was called mm -hmm. The Negro Question, Red Dreams of Black Liberation. This is a chapter, and it's a fascinating story, and it's not told in many other places, maybe other places, but not told widely, about about the communist movement in the first half of the 20th century mm -hmm. and black people, particularly black Americans who were involved in that and, and black immigrants too, who were involved in that. Tell me about the importance. And, and I would just say you, you yourself, uh, not in the early 20th century, but in the later 20, half of the 20th century for, for a short period of time, mm -hmm. were, was a member of the communist worker party. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, um, and, and this is where, uh, where I, I should just confess that th this book is really autobiographical. It's it sort of marks my own journey from from being a black nationalist to being a Marxist Leninist uh, Maoist you know, to being um, you know of course shaped by thorough liberation movements uh, to be pulled into black feminism and into sur surrealism. 
Uh, not to say that I left any of those things behind. You know, they 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 come they come with me. Uh, but this particular but you find this own a, transformation for you through the history of what happened, yes. sort of in the twentieth century. Exactly. I mean, that's why it's, the chapters are very personal. They're they're things that I have felt like I've studied and 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 experienced both in terms of of providing new energies but also revealing contradiction. But that's what happens to all of us. I mean, that's just life. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because that chapter brought me back to my, my doctoral dissertation, which was on the Communist Party in Alabama, which became my first book, Hammer and Ho. But what I tried to do in this chapter was to think not so much about movement on the ground, but ideas. And that is the ideas that Black intellectuals brought to the Communist Party in its, in its earlier iterations, uh, from Claude McKay to Claudia Jones, from W.B. Du Bois. It's, of course, C.L.R. James wasn't in the Communist Party, but he was uh, a, a Marxist. He was uh, involved with the Trotskyist movement for a while, then broke, uh, actually for a long while, then broke from that. Um, and in many ways was in the debates on the question of what was, what was then called the Negro question. And just to give you, you know, for readers, um, a sense, the Negro question, uh, is this thing that had been around the, uh, modern left really since the 19th century, at least. And that is what, what do we do with the Negro? <laughs> As if the Negro, black people are the object. The Negro question in the 19th century was about what to do with the slave. And of course, I mean, I don't, you know, all the, you know, Marx gets a bad rap unfairly. You know, I think people will talk about his blind spots and stuff. But if you really read Marx carefully, including his writing in New York Tribune, uh, you know, he was deeply anti slavery in a way that a lot of people were not. He understood the importance of, of emancipation. To, put, to generate new movements that really could emancipate the working class as a whole. Um, and, and I don't want to get into to that, but that's another story. But, but fundamentally, the Negro question has been haunting the left. Uh, the Communist Party is different from the socialists at that point because um, it's one of the first, uh, it is the first 20th century movement that tried to center the question of black liberation, I mean, from its from its inception. I mean, and this is important because the fact that the Communist International was having these meetings, these international meetings, first, second, third, fourth, and inviting black revolutionaries from South Africa, from the United States, from all over, to basically debate the question of black freedom and debate the question of, of socialism, and debate the question of what Communist Party should be doing. So in many ways, um, even though the Communist Party gets a bad rap, unfairly, it is probably the, the most attuned to the, what was called, considered a Negro question. What I argue in this chapter is that figures like Claudia Jones and Paul Robeson and Du Bois and others uh, Claude McKay, Richard Wright, they brought to the party a different vision than what the party understood the Negro question to be. They, they went from being objects to subjects, from being um, the problem to the solution. And that, that is what um, I try to argue here, and it, it wasn't taken up. Uh, you know, that and so what ends up happening, you see black intellectuals who are uh, at the forefront of anti-fascism, for example, who understood, for example, that fascism's roots were in colonialism and slavery. You know, they were making an argument before leaders of the CP were making an argument. They weren't making that argument. Um, these are the same uh, folks who during the Cold War, people like William L. Patterson, and certainly Du Bois and Robeson, were making arguments for reparations, making arguments, you know, that the history of the United States is a history of anti-Black genocide, uh, connecting police violence and lynching uh, as state-sanctioned violence, and saying that part of the struggle 
is to wage, to, to end that and to bring in international institutions like the United Nations, you know, uh, into that. This is, this was where the black left was in the post-war period. Oftentimes we think of the post-war period as this dark times of HUAC and the crushing of the left, but there was a visionary movement that erupted in the 1940s and 50s, one that I would argue, or I do argue, was far more emancipatory than what the party's main core line was. And in fact, far more emancipatory than many of the things that, that emerged after that. You know, but we have to go back and look and, re- and study them to really understand uh, what it meant. And finally, the last thing is that I try to struggle with the disconnect between the Southern Freedom Movement that emerged um, in the same period and the, uh, the liberatory dreams of the National Negro Congress and the Paul Robesons, the William L. Pattersons, the Carter Jones, who imagined if their ideas were the driving force behind the Southern Freedom Movement, and, 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 and to be fair, some of them were, they just were suppressed. Um, imagine what the civil rights movement would have looked like, how different it might have been, you know? There was and a how, split. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, and that's, that's, part of, that's part of what happens is the Cold War crushes um, some of those radical visionaries within the civil rights movement. Not all of them, some of them. I mean, we see this with the NAACP as well, don't we? Between a sort of power struggle, I guess, between Walter Jones and W.B. Du Bois. Yes, um, we see a, a struggle between Du Bois, who um, ends up drafting uh, the, the NAACP statement before the United Nations, um, uh, calling for you know, uh, investigation, call, you know, recognizing genocide before genocide was even, you know, uh, circulating as a major uh, idea. Um, and then Walter White. Walter White, forgive me. Right. Oh, no. Wal- Walter White, who who himself is anti-communist, has a long history of anti-communism, um, and also very jealous of Du Bois. They actually end up, I mean, I don't want to make this about personalities, but they they, they split in many ways. Um and, and there's this, another story to tell, which the history of the NAACP is being written, continue to be written as we go along. Because to be fair to someone like Walter White, the NAACP did try uh, in the post-war period uh, to intervene on this question of colonialism and on uh, national independence of the formerly uh, colonized uh, nations in, in Africa and Caribbean and Latin America. Um, but they were not willing to go as far as the Robesons and the Du Bois. Uh, and unfortunately, HUAC did play a role in silencing or trying to silence W.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson, taking their passports, you know, basically turning uh, segments of the Black middle class leadership against them. And that was a great tragedy. Because uh, imagine... You know, of course, now in 2022, people like Lorraine Hansberry, uh, Louise Thompson Patterson, Shirley Graham Du Bois, um, these are people that we can think of now as kind of heroic, as really important. Uh, But you got to understand what it meant in the 50s and early 60s for their names to be persona non grata, you know, and the loss uh, that entailed. Langston Hughes was a leader of a communist party. Yes. So that's also Hughes not definitely. well remembered today. It, it is not. Langston, Langston Hughes was was very active on the edges. I mean, he was very active in the uh, League of, of Struggle for, um, uh, I think it's called League of Revolutionary Struggle for Negro. Um, he was involved directly. His poetry his activism, of course, he he uh, spent time in the Soviet Union, um, wrote about it, uh, but he also suffered from the Cold War. And in fact, he had to tamp down his own political criticisms uh, in the 1950s for his own survival. You know, and that's something to, to to really remember. I mean, some people make a distinction between the Langston Hughes of the 30s and the Langston Hughes of the 50s, and until he dies in 67. 
But it's the same Langston Hughes. It's the same one who actually believed in sort of three major things. One, he actually believed in class struggle, that that the class, you know, is needs to become a class for itself to win. Two, that he believed that Black people, Black artists, should be able to say and do whatever the hell they want to do. That is to say, um, they don't have to conform to any particular line, but have the, the intellectual freedom and political freedom to take a stance. And the third thing that he did was he, he had a love for the vernacular language of Black people, you know, and he was able to turn that into, uh, into political art in a way that very few uh, artists have been able to do with exception of people like, you know, Zora Neale Hurston um, and others much later, you know, so those are the things that really make Langston Hughes like an, a unique uh, figure. And when you go back to his work, it feels so contemporary to this day. And, and Black women are also a part of this story. Somebody who worked closely with Langston who, Hughes, who I had not heard of until I read her name in your book, was Louise Thompson. Yes, Louise Thompson Patterson, her interesting, she's an interesting person. There's a a book in progress that will come out eventually uh, about her life. Um, imagine she's someone who's who you know was a significant young educator, a figure in the Harlem Renaissance. She was the one responsible for bringing a contingent of black writers, intellectuals, and and artists and actors to the Soviet Union initially to do this movie called Black and White, the Soviet-made movie never was made. And that's partly how Langston Hughes got there in the first place. Um, Langston and, and Louise were very tight. She also um, went to Spain during the Spanish Civil War and wrote, wrote about it. She ends up marrying uh, William L. Patterson, who was the, probably the highest ranking Black person in the Communist Party USA. Uh, and though she never officially kind of joined the party, I mean, she was in it, but not in it in a way uh, of of like in, of kind of leadership position. She was sort of in it. She was one of the most significant um, intellectuals uh, of the 20th century, both writing about art, politics, and, and women's uh, uh, power. Does the Soviet Union play a role in this history? Yes, it, it does play a role. I mean, um, in that chapter, and elsewhere, the chapter that follows, which is about third world liberation movements, I mean, whatever limitations the Soviet Union might have uh, uh, conveyed or, or displayed, I should say, you know, it was the space for utopian dreaming, especially if you didn't know much of what was going on inside of it. You know, what you knew was workers rose up and took power. They sat out in Soviets and they transformed the Soviets into national um, power. Um, they uh, were one of the biggest supporters of anti-colonial movements, not just in the 50s and 60s, but in the 30s. Um, the Soviet Union funded uh, the you know League, League Against Imperialism, for example. Um, they supported anti-imperialist movements. They were they were underwriting some of the journals like the Negro Worker, which were pushing for anti-colonial politics in the 1930s. Um, by the time you get to the post-war period and the post-Pan-African uh, Congress of uh, in Manchester, the fifth Pan-African Congress, you have erupting uh, liberation movements, guerrilla movements that are being funded by the Soviets. That's a huge thing. I mean, you know, um, if you're trying to win a war against colonial powers, those same colonial powers who are allies of the Soviet Union during World War II, you know, remember that, um, then you need whatever resources and support you can get. Uh, and it's not coming from the United States, you know. So to in many ways, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the U.S. Is, is funding and actually uh, participating in military operations against those movements. So in that sense, the Soviet Union does play an outsized role in this, you know, story. And 
the space of the Soviet Union, the space of the Communist International, International becomes the debating ground for how uh, Black and, and, and African in particular uh, and Brown and Indigenous Communists should proceed. You know, what, you know, they're having these debates, M.N. Roy from the Communist Party in India, uh, debating Lenin on national liberation. I mean, the fact that you actually have a platform where Claude McKay could give a, a presentation on the need to support radical nationalist independent autonomous movements like Garveyism, for example. Um, these are the things that made a difference. There was no platform within the Democratic Party <laughs> in the United States for black radicals to come and say, this is what we think, you know. Claude McKay is a name that has come up a few times now. Who, who was he? Claude McKay is was a, a Jamaican poet, writer, novelist, activist, uh, very close to the Communist Party, though he never really was a member um, per se. He was actually active uh, at one point uh, in the African Blood Brotherhood, which was one of the independent autonomous organizations that helped um, bring about the Black presence in the Communist Party. It's a very, very good uh, biography of... Uh, um, of McKay by Winston James that just came out not long ago. So I suggest that. But he was someone who, like I said, was very independent as an artist. I mean, I think his um, uh, he never really got the, the recognition as a radical that he really deserved. And he was someone also whose novels really captured the internationalism of, of both um, the kind of black communist insurgency, but also its limits. You no, know, uh, he he's written about the campaign to defend Ethiopia from the Italian invasion uh, in this really quite hilarious um, novel that just recently discovered and published, um, and called "Amiable with Big Teeth." And then he's also written about. Uh, the kind of waterfront workers in Marseille, uh, this multiracial in the 1930s uh, of these kind of active, you know, really pan-African, um, uh, 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 quite radical, both intellectuals and workers, and just what that culture like looked like, you know. So he was someone who I think, you know, really deserves, um, you know, a, a rethinking in, in, a, in a new look. Third World Liberation Front is something more recent, I think, in our collective memory. Uh, people still alive today who were a part of that. Um, is is it thinking back to the first half of the 20th century? Should we see black communist movement as a precursor to that, as leading to what we'd get later? Yes, I, I would. I would. I would agree with that. That in many ways. Um, Though black internationalism itself is very old, it took on a particular um, valence in the 1920s and 30s. So I would say two things. One is that the Communist Party is one place where there's a precursor for that because of the kinds of international structures that allowed for travel, debate, engagement across these you know, national lines. Um, but then there's another side to it. That is, there's the anti-communist left the anti-Stalinist left, I should say, not the anti-communist, but the anti-Stalinist left, um, uh, centered around people like C.L.R. James and others who formed, and George Padmore, uh, uh, who formed groups like the International African Service Bureau. And they're based in London, and they're also connected with other movements around the world that are also uh, laying the foundations for what becomes a kind of third world uh, radicalism as well. Um, one of the, the the pitfalls, and this is a very specific to Soviet history, is that the the internationalist vision of the 1930s that was tied to the Communist Party and to Black people in it was derailed in many ways by a particular kind of anti-fascism that um, promoted the notion of socialism within co one country in defending the Soviet Union at all costs. 
Um, now, if sort I were the, living the in those split times, with Stalin is this? Is yeah, this with, the yes, split exactly. With this is this is with this is. I mean, basically, it haunts the left up to this day. Oh yeah, <laughs> and as it should, and and we should take lessons from that. Um, and I think some of the lessons, because of course, this, this is the Nazi Soviet Pact, which you know your listeners may know this, but basically was an agreement uh, between um, Hitler and the Soviets to basically say, look, for the time being, uh, we're going to do a non-aggression uh, uh, treaty. You don't invade us, we won't enter this war and fight you. You know, uh, and everyone knew it was temporary. And, and But it's seen as such a betrayal and all this other stuff. But, you know, if you're living in that moment, and if you believe, and this is, again, this has to do with perspective. If you're an internationalist who believes that internationalism's uh, survival depends on the survival of the Soviet Union, then you're going to go for that. You're going to support that. You know, it's a reasonable position to take. If you don't believe that internationalism depends on the survival of the Soviet Union, then what you will do is you'll say, we're gonna fight fascism no matter where it is. We're not gonna spend our time upholding the Soviets, but rather we're gonna fight it where it is. And so we're gonna go to Spain and we're gonna fight it there. We're gonna go to Ethiopia, we're gonna fight it there. We're gonna fight it everywhere, hoping that the future is not socialism in one country, but socialism around the world. Now. Of course, some listeners like, oh, you're a Trotskyist, you know, why, Michelle, what's wrong with you? I'm not any of those things. <laughs> I'm just laying out what were the debates. And, you know, all, and, and this is very important because why is the Soviet Union important? Because it was among some elements of those who broke from Trotsky, like C.L.R. James, who came to the conclusion that the Soviet Union is not some deformed, worker state. It is not a worker state at all. The Soviet Union could have been, but it became a state capitalist, you know, institution. If that it became state capitalism, you know, but one that that is in the name of working people, but not really for their benefit. So that's the point where a particular segment of the left said, you know what, we're not doing any of this. Now, third world liberation, let's make a connection here. One of the possible tragedies of third world liberation movements, which I don't talk about in the book, is the limits of nationalism. Part of what these movements were trying to do was create socialism in one state. That is to say, to fight for their freedom, fight for independence within the nation state form. But once you do that, you're limited. You're limited in terms of you know, how you govern, you're living in terms of resources available to you. you and then it, it produces certain kinds of possibilities for other kinds of nationalisms, whether it's in the Congo, where one segment is trying to succeed uh, in the Katanga region, because that's where the mineral wealth is, and it's supported by the United States and others, or in Nigeria, where another se segment is trying to succeed, again, around oil wealth, uh, in the Biafra War. Um, nationalism is a very dangerous thing. It, it may serve a certain kind of, of a mobilization power, and the state certainly is important to be able to, to become a redistributive force. But ultimately, it's very hard to have this continent of Africa, for example, broken up into all these different states with borders, boundaries, laws, and rules, and regulations. And that's where, again, in terms of third world dreaming, there was a dream on the part of people like Kwame Nkrumah that says, we want one United States of Africa. We're, we don't want the nation state as we know it. And Mises Césaire, like, we don't want the nation state as we know it. Leopold Senghor, we don't want the nation state as we know it. We want something bigger. We want to turn the old commonwealth into a socialist commonwealth. And that is still, to this day, a debate that we're having, you know? Hence, freedom dreams. And the exactly. idea of dreaming and the importance of dreaming. Exactly. Robin D. G. Kelly has been our guest. He has joined us to talk about his book, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, which is being republished this year after being written originally 20 years ago. 
He is also a distinguished professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. Professor Kelly, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you, Mitch. It's always a pleasure.